going on the other side of Kant is where all of these billionaires and where every other successful achiever ends up going. You tend to think you're better than you are at something. And yeah. so idea sex is so powerful. It's a real powerful technique for creativity. Hey, Evan, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good. This is uh, such a blessing to just stay indoors all the time. <laughs> Right? I've, been, yeah. I've seen you going live on Instagram like every 40 minutes. There's a new James Altucher IG Live going on. Yeah, yeah. No, I've been doing it once a day at 2 p.m. Just to kind of – I feel like it's important to calm people down a little bit because there's so much – I mean, obviously, this is a horrible crisis, and people are rightly concerned and, and for many reasons. But I think the hysteria has begun, gone beyond concern and beyond caution, and I think it's good to balance – the panic in the news with the reality. Yeah. So that's what I've been trying to do. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, we got the legendary James Altucher in the house. How do we describe this man? Uh, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, podcaster, comedy club owner, YouTuber? Getting there? Not quite a YouTuber yet. It, we're, we're I, I'm, I'm trying to study your model though. We're working on it. I, I've been on his awesome show. He's been on mine. Uh, he's coming back. He's got a new book. Think like a billionaire. Uh, is it? Can you actually get a hard copy of Think Like a Billionaire? Or is it? Only yeah, uh, but I don't. I'm not really selling it. I have hard copies that I kind of uh, give out with other products. But the main place to get it, I think, the best place to get it right now is on Scribd. S C R I B D. It's a Scribd original, so mm -hmm. you can get the script version which is a digital version and also the uh audio version they sell an audio version not a sell but they get for free an audio version of the book and they, they did a nice job editing it as well so your books have been covering such a wide range of topics over the years of you of an author what now made you want to write about thinking like a billionaire well you know i've interviewed a lot of let's call them billionaires uh on my podcast everybody from mark Cuban, Richard Branson, Sarah Blakely, who's the founder of Spanx, mm -hmm. uh, many, you know, many other people, even if they're not billionaires, they've created maybe billion dollar products or companies like Damon John has sold $6 billion worth of clothes through FUBU. Uh, Tyra Banks has created a billion, multi-billion dollar franchise with America's Next Top Model. And, you know, altogether, maybe there's about 15 to 20 billionaires I've interviewed. And the whole thing is, is that I've been so bad with money in my life. You know, someone asked me, well, why should we listen to you about how to think like a billionaire? You're not a billionaire and you go broke all the time. So, so I've made money many times and I've gone broke almost every single time. It's been an incredibly painful experience, depressing, horrible, horrifying. I don't want to wish it on anybody. Uh, and I, I started off dead broke, but it's, it's, I wasn't miserable then. I was kind of happy then. But then after you make money and you sell a business and you build it and then you lose all of it, you feel like years and years worth of work were for nothing and you got to start from scratch again. And it's just so painful. But I wanted to see from all of these other people, again, ranging from Ray Dalio, who's the biggest hedge fund manager in the world, to Mark Cuban and others, I wanted to see what did they do to kind of grow their money and, and keep it and then continue to grow it. And it's a special kind of personality. Like I, I could never make a billion because I would just sell before then. If I was building a company and someone offered me one one hundredth of that, I would, I would sell no matter what. But, um, you know, there, there, can I tell you one story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was interviewing Peter Thiel and, you know, he was the founder of PayPal. He was the first investor in Facebook. He made billions on Facebook. He made billions on another company called Palantir. And he was telling me how uh, when Mark Zuckerberg, in the, in the early days of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg was offered by Microsoft a billion dollars for Facebook. And, and Mark Zuckerberg would have made $250 million. He was a 24-year-old kid with no money, and he would have made $250 million. Can you imagine being 24 years old and being offered a quarter of a billion dollars? And he said no. And the whole board, including Peter Thiel, was pushing him to say yes. And Mark Zuckerberg finally said, and this is what Peter Thiel was repeating to me, Mark Zuckerberg said, you know, if I had $250 million, what would I do for the rest of my life? Well, I'd probably create a website where other people could communicate with each other. And, it, <laughs> it, and uh, but I've already got that. So uh, why would I 
need to sell what I already have and, and just do it again. Mm. And so, of course, now, you know, Zuckerberg's worth like, I don't know, 50 or 60 billion. And Peter Thiel made many billions on Facebook. So it all worked out. But, you know, that's a different type of mentality, a different type of mindset. And that's what I was interested in, in discovering. Like, is there consistent um, differences in mindset? And it was very interesting to talk to all of these people. How much of the book and those interviews was prescriptive for you that you want to get better and learn from? Or is it, this isn't me, but I want to share their secrets? No, it was very prescriptive for me. Like, I don't do a podcast with someone unless I want to learn from them. And I, I know you, you're the same way. That's why you always have the 10 lessons from so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Look, I learned, that's why I was, when, in, when you were on my podcast, I'm just drilling you on how to get better at YouTube because I'm right. selfishly trying to learn. <laughs> and presumably if I'm interested, then my audience is largely interested. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I always am like eager to find out what makes someone tick. And I don't know. There were so many things I learned. Like, for instance, here, here was a common thing with many of these people. Uh, it's what I call the ready, fire, aim strategy that they all seem to use. Like, uh, a great example would be Damon John. This is a guy who was a, he was a, a waiter at Red Lobster, you know, the casual dining chain. And on the weekends, he would sew these hats and put a hip hop logo on it. And uh, just sell to friends or people passing by or whatever. And then he went to a clothing conference. He got a, a $300,000 order, I think from Macy's. And he said, yes, I'll do it. And this is what I call ready, fire, aim. He couldn't fulfill a $300,000 order. He was just by himself sewing hats and logos onto hats. But, but he didn't say, he didn't say what I might've said or what many people would have said, which is, oh, darn, how about I just do a $5,000 order for you and then I'll build up. I don't even have the money to do this. I don't have the employees. He just said yes, and I'm sure in his head he was thinking, I'll figure this out. It's a $300,000 order. I will figure this out. And he, he then went and mortgaged his mom's house. And he, he, that weekend, he hired a bunch of seamstresses. He filled up the house with all these people sewing. He, he finished sewing enough hats to, to fulfill the $300,000 order, got delivered the hats to Macy's, got the money, paid down the mortgage, and boom, he had some money. And and by the way, he didn't full force start FUBU, his clothing empire, even then. He still stayed as a waiter at Red Lobster uh, until he really had enough orders consistently that he quit full time. And I find a lot of these billionaires actually to be extremely risk averse. You hmm. would think these entrepreneurs, these, these billionaires took a lot of risk to get there. No, they're very, very risk averse. They do things, even though he said yes, without knowing what he was doing, and he took the risk of mortgaging his mom's house, he knew he had a contractual order from Macy's. It was not like he was going to deliver and they wouldn't pay. And he knew how to make the hats. He priced it out. He knew he could hire these people. He could finish it in a weekend. And he did it. And, you know, uh, Sarah Blakely with Spanx is a very similar uh, uh, story. She got a huge order from Neiman Marcus. She had not even made two versions of her product yet. And, and what did she do? She said yes. She had no factory, no manufacturer. She needed a manufacturer to fulfill, fulfill this order. And she was, at the time, she was selling fax machines door to door. What manufacturer is going to return her phone calls? And yet she was able to persuade uh, one to return her phone calls. She, 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 she fulfilled the order and she made the money. So what's the lesson for you in that? Because you don't strike me as a guy who's just sitting there planning, planning, planning and not doing right. I mean, you've taken a bunch of risks. You've said yes to things. Is it just order of magnitude? Yeah, I think, I think for me, what I learned there is how to st how to say risk in what seem like high stakes situations, but at the same time, you reduce the risk as much as possible. So when I've lost money, it's usually because I was saying yes to a lot of opportunities without really taking into account the risk. So I always assumed, oh, um, I sold my first company. I sold my second company. I can take, I know how to judge whether this is a good enough risk or not. And the reality is, I think in general, we're very poor judges of the risks that we take. We have this tendency to, um, 
uh, it's like, it, I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where you tend to think you're better than you are at something. So for instance, nine out of 10 drivers think that they are above the median drivers. You right. know, they, they think they're above average drivers. And that is just impossible. Like only four out of five uh, out of 10 will be above average. And uh, I, I kind of learned to repeat to myself almost as a mantra that I am bad and stupid at everything. And to, I, I kind of make my decisions from that point of view to basically eliminate the risk as much as, as possible in every venture that I do. So, so for instance, let's say I want to try out a business. I'll figure out a way to experiment a little first. Uh, and by experiment, I mean try something where I can test out the idea but risk very little money and risk very little time um, but have enormous, enormous upside. And I think that's when you, when you get into that kind of mindset, it's easier for you to do ready, fire, aim. So I'll give you another example is uh, like Richard Branson. So he was already a successful magazine publisher. He was 27 years old. He was a music magazine publisher. And just like that, he decides, I want to start an airline. And everyone was like, and, and this is also a very common thing. Um, everyone basically said to him, Richard, you are crazy. You can't do that. You're a 27-year-old kid. You're just, you just know the music magazine business. And by the way, British Airways is, a, is a practically a government-run monopoly. There were no other airlines in England. How are you going to compete against a monopoly? And you need, you need $100 million to buy an airplane. Where are you going to find $100 million? So Richard Branson, in very ready, fire, aim fashion, was like, no problem. And he calls up Boeing and somehow he convinces Boeing to lend him a plane. He's 27 years old. They were, he, let, he convinced them, he persuaded them to lend him a plane. So a, a lot of these billionaires have very strong persuasion abilities. And persuasion is a skill that can be learned and studied and mastered. You can start off as a very bad persuader and you can end up being a very strong persuader. But Richard Branson had it. I think he had it from the beginning. And then he, and then for, he convinced Heathrow give me a landing strip for a year. So he borrowed a plane and he was going to return it in a year. He, he essentially borrowed from Heathrow a landing strip. JFK gave him another landing strip. And now he was an international airline all of a sudden. Boom. He didn't even, he didn't need any money at, up front. I mean, he did eventually, but that's like an amazing case of, of not taking any risks for himself, but starting an airline, which he then sold for billions you know, many years later, and now he's got a rocket ship company, uh, Virgin Galactic. So seemingly high risk to the outside world, but actually very low risk. Yeah, like if he wrote a check for $100 million out of his yeah. pocket, that would have been high risk. Instead, he, he risked pretty much almost nothing, and it cost him nothing to call Boeing and try to – if, if Boeing had said no, maybe he never would have started the airline – and, and we never would have known anything. He, he would have started some other business and been successful at that. I mean, he started over 300 businesses. But again, it's trying to do things as low risk as possible. And I feel like I had that mentality when I started off as an entrepreneur. But for many years, I lost it. I, I was too overconfident. I was suffering from this Dunning-Kruger bias. And it's only when I started really reminding myself that I am an idiot. I need to reduce my risk as much as possible in every situation that I really started to kind of not only make better money with less risk, but uh, keep the money as well, which is really important. What do you think is a billion dollar ready, fire, aim opportunity in front of James Altucher right now? Oh gosh, I, I don't know because the other thing is, and this is why I probably would never be a billionaire. Again, a lot of these habits that I, I learned from them uh, have, they do have something to do with entrepreneurship and making a billion dollars, but not always. Like you can, you can do ready, fire, aim, or there's another one I, I commonly refer to as idea sex, where you take two ideas and combine them to a brand new, unique idea. Uh, just a quick example, Tyra Banks took, uh, and she described it to me how she, she loved the show America's Got Talent. She was also a supermodel who was kind of semi-retired. She combined those two ideas to create this show format for America's next top, top model. All of her agents and all the TV, everybody rejected her and, but no problem. It doesn't cost her anything to try to produce it. So she produced it. It got picked up. Uh, and now it's in its, I don't know, 31st or 32nd season. It's syndicated in 
over 100 countries or some enormous number of countries. It's a multi-billion dollar entity. And that's a great example of IdeaSex, taking two successful ideas, combining them in a way no one surprisingly had ever done before and having a huge idea. So this is more about just execution, creativity, productivity, getting things done. And I would say for myself, I'm not that interested in making, you know, a billion dollars, but these same habits, and I list a whole bunch of habits in, in the book that I learned from these guys and, and, and ladies, uh, these, these habits I've been able to use in, in many other areas of my life. So for instance, and this is just an obscure example, but I don't know, five years ago, uh, uh, the owner of a comedy club that I, that I knew of asked me to asked me if I wanted to do stand-up comedy for five minutes on their stage. I had no clue at all what I was doing, but of course I just said yes, because what's my downside? It cost me nothing, and it would take five minutes of my time, maybe a little bit more time coming up with material. And so I did it, and the worst that could happen is a random group of strangers in, a, in a, uh, the basement of a bar would, would not like me, and then I would go home and never do it again. But I really enjoyed it, and it became a skill that I wanted to, to master and, and, and learn. It was a very difficult skill, and I've been doing it for the past five or six years. Uh, I just actually, right before this whole crisis hit, I toured all over the Netherlands, did performances in, in many major cities there. I've been all over the country performing. And so now it's a skill in my, in my toolkit. Now, I don't make, I've made very little money from it. It's not a, a skill you want to learn if you want to just focus on money, but life's not just about money. And again, it's, it's having kind of ready fire aim and then even kind of coming up with material. There's a lot of idea sex in there and, and other habits and so on. But this is just some random area that I decided to learn, but I use the habits that I learned from these billionaires. Did you label idea sex? Is that your idea? Uh, I don't think so, actually. I think it was, I think Matt Ridley talks about it in the book, Rational Optimist. Okay. But I, I've certainly probably written about it more than anyone else. And, and I use it all the time. So I've even done workshops where I'll have people come up with a list of 10 ideas and then talk to your neighbor and combine your 10 ideas with his or her 10 ideas and see what they is result. And it's always amazing the results. Usually the first lists are boring. And then that combined list is like amazing. And yeah. so idea sex is so powerful. I mean, just think about, just think about all the, even, you know, how do they describe movies? When you pitch a movie, like George Lucas goes in and pitches Star Wars, he says it's a Western mixed with science fiction. Boom, idea sex, Star Wars. Uh, so there's, there's so many examples of, of this sort of thing that uh, it's a real powerful technique for creativity. I think to a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll often come and say, hey, I want to do this or I want to do this. And the answer is you got to figure out a way to do both that nobody's done before. Yeah, I mean, you see it all the time where, um, you know, just take Facebook, for instance, and this was out of my conversation with, again, with Peter Thiel. I said, what was so original about Facebook? Uh, and, you know, there was already MySpace, Friendster, GeoCities, Tribe.com. There was a million social networks before then. And he said, no, it was the only social network with confirmed identity. So that's what made it unique. But if you think about it, a lot of websites confirm your identity. Amazon confirms your identity before you buy uh, goods on on Amazon. You can't just use a fake identity and a fake credit card and so on. You have to have a confirmed identity. So they took this concept of confirmed identity, which was already uh, you know, well known on the internet, and they took this concept of a social network, which was well known on the internet. They combined them together and you have Facebook. So this is a very powerful idea. It puts you in the least crowded room, which is where you always want to be, whether you want to be a successful entrepreneur, a successful writer, a successful YouTuber, a successful comedian, a successful anything. You should be, you should go to the room that's least crowded. Else you have too much competition and it's too difficult. Making a me too business never has a, the right kind of value. It always, it's almost like a commodity is valued cheaply and, and you just won't be able to grow as fast because you have too much competition. I love it. Okay. Last question. Uh, achievers. So a lot of my audience are entrepreneurs. They're probably the biggest achievers in their, in their group, in their family, in their network. Think like a billionaire. The message for achievers, the biggest thing I'm going to pull from your book is what? I think if, if you're going to, I, I think this concept of going to the room that is least crowded, you want to find your own unique voice. And you know this as a successful YouTuber. What you do on YouTube is different 
from what everyone else does. You have a unique voice, which has captured for you a unique audience, and you've created very good, unique content. You're able to build up this content without any competition because no one had the exact approach you were taking. And then there's another thing too, which is when you try to do something unique, everyone is gonna tell you, almost by definition, you can't do that because they're gonna say this for two reasons. One is because no one else has ever done it before. Uh, so be, but almost by definition, you're the only person in the room, so no one's ever done it. So they're gonna start off saying, based on their, their own knowledge, they're gonna say, you can't do this. And the other thing is, another group of people are gonna say can't, which are people who are already successful. They're gonna say, you can't do that. You, need, you can't skip the line. You have to wait your turn. I did this for 20 years and now I'm, now I'm doing it. Let me do it first. And they're gonna tell you, you can't do that. And I bet you when you started with YouTube, you had all these YouTubers saying, ah, this guy, he's just, he's just put in these like 10 lessons on. That's not gonna go anywhere. And they were probably saying, you can't do this. Or, or maybe your family was saying, oh, Evan, there's already a billion minutes of content being uploaded to YouTube every minute. How are you gonna stand out? And you have to go to the other side of can't. And you have to have enough confidence in yourself and enough obsession and, and passion for what you're doing to be able to figure out, because the people who are telling you you can't do it, they're not as passionate as you are. They're not as obsessed as you are. They don't know the real details of your idea. They don't have your skill sets. So they're just saying it for their own agenda and their own reasons. They're really saying that they can't do it, so they don't want you to do it. And going on the other side of can't is where all of these billionaires and where every other successful achiever ends up going. They go on the other side of the word can't. I love it. Well, the book is called Think Like a Billionaire. James Altucher, where can we pick it up and where can people find you and dive deeper into your world? Yeah, so uh, you can pick it up on Scribd, S-C-R-I-B-D. Scribd.com is sort of like a Netflix for books. And uh, they, they do very few what they call Scribd originals, sort of like Netflix has original TV shows. Scribd now has just started the past few months doing original books. And so as an experiment, I, to see what would happen, I published this book there. I, I published my next book is with Harper Collins. So I publish, I self-publish, I publish with mainstream publishers and I want to do an experiment publishing with Scribd and it's worked out very well. And um, so you can find the audio book and the digital book at Scribd.com, S-C-R-I-B-D.com. And they've been, they're a very great site, the Netflix of books. I don't know if they might be calling them the Netflix of books, but that's what it kind of is. <laughs> if you mix the Western with sci-fi, right? Well, if you mix the, the Netflix model with books, you get You script. got script. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, James. Appreciate you, man. We'll link all that up down below. Go check it out. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Thanks a lot. If you want to see the last one-on-one -on -one I did with James Altucher around his book, Choose Yourself, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.